Hi everyone, uh, my name is Catherine and I'm delighted to welcome you to this webinar today on how to be a great drug discovery chemist. Uh, we're about to be joined by leading researchers from across the drug discovery industry for discussion and debate about what skills, qualities and knowledge make a great drug hunter. With that, I am pleased to uh, introduce Chase, your host, um, to get us started. So. Chase is an organic and medicinal chemist by training with over 10 years of experience in the biotech industry and over 10 years of experience uh, in academia, teaching in schools of pharmacy. Um, since joining Optibrium, Chase has filled multiple roles supporting customers as part of the application science group and contributed to software development as a member of the product management team. Uh, his background in drug discovery means he's the perfect person to host discussions today. So uh, without further ado, I will hand over to you, Chase. Thank you, Catherine. Um, and again, welcome everybody today uh, for our webinar. Um, just to begin, I'd like to have the opportunity just to thank uh, our uh, distinguished panel for agreeing to, particip uh, to participate today in today's webinar. And I'm really looking forward to hearing some of their uh, comments and thoughts on drug discovery and, and what it takes to be a great, dis uh, a great drug discovery chemist. Um, first off, we have Dr. Ashley F uh, Fenwick, who earned his PhD in synthetic organic chemistry from the Imperial College in Lo of London and has since had an extensive history as a drug uh, hunter. He started at GSK, where he worked approximately for about 18 years before joining uh, Pfizer, where at Pfizer he had a tenure of approximately 13 years there. And while at Pfizer, Ashley served as an associate director for many of their discovery projects during his time there. He then subsequently moved to Zoetis uh, in 2013 to fill a research director role before he most recently uh, joined Horizon Therapeutics as a consultant. We also are lucky to have Dr. Sonia Gutierrez uh, today, who earned her PhD in organic chemistry from the University of Salamanca, with additional research uh, placements at Cambridge University with Professor Goodman, UCLA with Professor Hauk, and also at Merck Sharp and Dome. She has 23 years of experience at Eli Lilly across multiple medicinal chemistry and computa computational chemistry roles. And Sonia is currently the Director of Discovery Research and Technology at Eli Lilly, and she's instrumental in leading their computational strategy in, a, in approximately 45 medicinal chemistry projects. And last but not least, we were uh, fortunate to have Dr. Kenneth, uh, Dennis Kester uh, here today. Dennis obtained his PhD in organic chemistry from the the University of uh, Guttenheim, followed by undertaking postdoctoral research positions at both the University of Munster as well as also Stanford University. Before he joined Fibrogen in 2022, he was a drug hunter at the Novartis Institute for Biomedical Research Programs, where he worked on programs in both infectious and tropical diseases. Uh, Dennis currently works in oncology and in immuno-oncology drug discovery, with medicinal chemistry experience, and he spans property-driven as well as target-based uh, drug discovery programs. So once again, we're fortunate to have uh, these uh, distinguished speakers, and thank you for joining us. I'd like to start out the panel today, um, and I think I, my first question, uh, again, is for everybody, but maybe we'll start out with uh, Dennis, since he was the first one to uh, <laughs> come on here. Uh, so the first question I'd like to, to get some of your opinions on are, what do you think are the qualities of a successful drug discovery scientist today? And also, how might these be changing in the upcoming years? Dennis. Yeah, Chase, thank you. First of all, thanks for having me here. I, I guess I'm the, <laughs> the youngest scientist on the panel, so I, I'm glad to see also a lot of uh, early stage career scientists signing in today. Yeah, this is a great question, Jay. So I think um, it is, you know, being a drug hunter um, requires multiple different skills. And I, I think no one person can have them all, right? Like a drug discovery team consists of disease biology, medicinal chemistry, pharmacology, pharmacokinetics, toxicology, many other disciplines. And the technical knowledge, I don't think can be, you know, had by just one person. So I think what is important for somebody who's leading a project is communication skills, right? Decision-making skills. So you have to be able to work with a team um, effectively and communicate effectively with your team, 
coming to decisions because you know like in, in a project it is really important to me to have key scientific questions and really answer them and to get to the key experiments and in order to do that you have to be able to communicate with your fellow uh, scientists on your project team and then regarding the future i think you know as uh, artificial intelligence is is on everybody's mind right now with uh, chat gpt i think in the future, it's going to be uh, really more important to be able to work with machines. I don't think that we'll be, as medicinal chemists or drug hunters in general, be replaced by machines anytime soon. But that being said, uh, the collaboration between uh, you know software or computers and human uh, is getting more and more important. And uh, being able to stay on on the edge of of that development, I think, uh, is a, is an important skill going forward. That's interesting. Um, and actually, it was, uh, it, we're not really uh, we didn't uh, want to have a focus on AI. But um, what do you think? As sort of a follow up to that, since you did mention AI, what do you think are some of the seminal proof principles? Because sometimes there is some some healthy skepticism on AI. Um, what what do we have to watch out for? What has to be proven before it becomes a little bit more ingrained in, in mainstream drug discovery? Yeah, uh, great question. I think what today what it's really good at is like uh, synthetic knowledge, right? Retro synthetic re retro synthetic analysis, and that's because there is a large, uh, you know, a vast amount of literature out there. Uh, and most of it, I mean, there's a lot of garbage in literature tr too. <laughs> so that's that's kind of difficult. But the, the models, the AI models, are only as good as the training sets, right? But I've noticed really uh, in in the past for the for the synthetic um, um, models to become better and better. They give you better and better suggestions um, in in how to synthesize molecules. But yeah, that being said, what has to be proven? I mean, it's you know, disease biology is extremely complex. So again, it, it's gonna and the data, the data has to be really good in order to train the models. So it, in my opinion, it'll take a a, a bit of time uh, to yeah. until we're we're get getting there. But uh, as long as we keep increasing the amount of data and uh, particularly good data, really uh, data that's valid, right? Uh, in that case, I think we'll uh, we'll get there at some point. Sure. Thank you very much, uh, Sonia. I wonder if we could get your opinions on the the qualities of, and skills of a successful drug discovery scientist today. Oh, that's a that's a that's a difficult one, right? So I think that I mean, would you need to? Um, what are your skills in medicinal chemistry? I think that actually Dennis already mentioned some of them, right? So in, uh, to be a drug discovery, you are actually need to know about many disciplines. So then uh, you, I think that one of the most important things is just to be passionate. This is not kind of um, a work that is easy to do. So sometimes you need to deal with a lot of frustration. So I think that to me, the, the word as well that is kind of uh, coming to my mind all the time is resilience, right? So you need to be resilient enough to actually deal with the frustration at the same time that your passion is moving you forward. So you need to jam a lot of obstacles. So then for doing this, so you need to keep learning. These days, you, everyone knows, and actually the ones who, we, who, who actually joined 20 years ago, that we have been learning in the process of drug discovery since we joined. There has been a lot of differences from we joined 20 years ago in a big pharma to what is coming now, right? Where the computational chemistry teams has grown significantly, where medicinal chemists are actually using a lot of different applications where we have in the world of a lot of data. So then one of the important things is just to be obsessed with the data you have, to be actually very uh, flexible, to change your mind immediately, because I mean, the data is telling you a different thing. And then for this, you need to be prepared, right? So then uh, I think that, I mean, today it is a very well skilled organic chemists are needed in the organization. So, but one of the things that is critical, it is actually to have everyone together being a big team. 
right? So as Dennis mentioned, so I guess that not one person can actually solve all problems, but as long as you are actually working together in teams, you are a big team working for a one purpose, or purpose that is kind of difficult to actually get the goal done. And we are here for, for patients, right? So for building medicines, that is the most important thing. And, and I think that just having this in mind is helping everyone to move forward. It's difficult these days because you have, I guess that the chemists in the future, what I imagine is gonna be kind of even kind of chemo, in between chemo med chem, right? That is able to actually jump into different services, hopefully also with a scripting um, with a scripting skills that it, it will help them as well to move forward in the new world. So and uh, and then just, but it's interesting because we are all we are all challenging. I mean, the challenges are exactly the same three decades ago, right? So we you need to build permeable compounds to design soluble compounds, active compounds, but you have a completely different tools to do that. So then it's, that's, that's, uh, that's, I, I, if you are passionate, I think that you can do all you, all it is in front of you. Excellent. Oh, th thank you very much for those. And actually, maybe we can follow up finally with, uh, uh, with Dr. Fenwick on some of your thoughts on the same topic. Yep. And I uh, reinforce many of the comments that were just made. Um, you do need soft skills. They are very important because you are dealing in a team environment. So uh, they're not always uh, trained so much when you're at uh, college, but they are exceedingly important for a, a team environment. And uh, that sort of broad understanding of the drug discovery process and, and our partner groups. And although you're never going to be the expert, you have to rely if you work in a team. You need an awareness about what all of your partners do and how to interpret their data and how to interact with them to get the most out of that whole team environment. Um, and you certainly need the flexibility that Sonia was saying. I mean, things have changed so much and you need to be open to it and you need to be able to embrace those changes. I, I agree with Dennis, I, AI is gonna be a, a big important thing. I actually think that the data analysis side of it might be where it has a bigger impact because we're dealing with a multifactorial problem here. We're balancing all these different things and the only real lever we got is changing the structure. So trying to relate, you know, sort of how that changes to all of these parameters, I think is where AI could really help. And it's gonna be overhyped. Every time something big comes through, it's overhyped. It's gonna be the next big thing. It never delivers the hype, but it always has an impact. So you need to be able to embrace it, but just bear in mind, yeah, it doesn't mean you're just gonna lose your job, uh, but it's gonna be a really useful tool. I think the one one thing they, they didn't touch on, I think critical thinking is really important as well. Um, mm -hmm. Because one of the problems we always face is dogma and the, um, you've got to have this group here. And actually the only reason is because no one's ever challenged it. So mm -hmm. got to, you know, really be um, able to go in there and challenge things and look for what data actually supports these contentions and well, what does data actually say. So I think critical thinking is really going to be a, an important skill to have as well if you're going to be a success, successful drug discoverer. But yeah, I would say, you know, flexibility, broad understanding, critical thinking, um, soft skills, strategy and planning as well. You've got to know where you're going to go and how you're going to get there. So all those things come together. I, I, actually, if I could dig in a little bit deeper to some of your comments at the at the end there for critical thinking, um, how how would a I would say a chemist or a researcher on their earlier side, uh, a little less seniority, if they wanted to challenge some of the thinking, whether it's um, you know rule of five type of challenges or something else. <laughs> Um, what, 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 how do they approach that uh, in an environment where obviously they're not the most senior? What was, what, what's, how can they do that or navigate those waters? Yeah, I, I, one thing I've always tried to push on teams is you should always actually have a question in mind. Any compound you make, always, what am I going to get out of this compound? Because it's very easy to make 10 compounds which actually address the same question. So, you know, you can you can actually at that level when you're down to I can I make these ones, make these selection, you can actually use those critical thinking things to 
make sure you're you're efficient in terms of what you're making and not just making um i think you know the, the way to challenge dogma and everything is data so digging into the data uh sending compounds out and sort of well you know this compound didn't look so great but actually we still should get the admi because you know and mm -hmm. so you know and uh, and, it's, and it's always a balance as well yeah if you're going to yeah. propose a 20 step synthesis to make something you've got to be pretty good in terms of having the data behind it if it's just doing a one-step thing don't ask just do it and you're a hero if it works so, um, <laughs> Yeah, maybe I can actually just add he, something right. here. So I think that what could be very beneficial for um, um, new scientists is just to have a mentor. So just to find someone else who has been working in the organization in your same role, or even in different roles that can give you a different perspective. So I think that I, I would really just try to invite everyone to actually, not always the first person that you think that is gonna be a good mentor for you is gonna be the case, right? So it might not be the first one, might be the second, the third, right? But at the end, you will be able to find someone else who, who really understand your issues and uh, how to actually move forward and how you can actually learn in the process, right? So mm -hmm. I think that everyone, I guess that everyone who is in this uh, meeting is actually really facing that you have to learn daily, right? Learning about data, learning about how to move forward, even though, as we said at the beginning, we are actually just doing the same as, as three decades ago, right? Just, just to, mm -hmm. to, to actually just design new medicines. The way how design new medicines is true that has been changed significantly too. We have a lot of new modalities. And again, there are more coming that we need to actually embrace as well. So then just uh, my, I guess that my advice, he would be just to find a, a mentor that can give you kind of an overview about what the in industry, if you are actually just embracing the industry, it is actually about and uh, how you can actually just move your career in the right direction. I see. Actually, it's quite fascinating. And actually, you've brought it up a, a few times about while there are some constants and you, you were, the, you know, the idea or the goal of finding a drug 30 years ago is the same. Mm. We, we need to treat um, some type of uh, malady or disease. How about now today? What 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 software is supporting your current work? And how would some of your projects 20 or so years ago have changed, or projects changed the way you approached it if you had some of the same tools today? Oh, the first one that I say on the top of my mind, I'm a computational chemist now. So it's mm -hmm. molecular dynamics for sure, right? Free energy perturbation. So this makes our life change significantly in general. So then uh, we are uh, now just not running initially at the, like join Lily very 20 years ago, we were only running pharmacophor models, building uh, every case using uh, anal conformational analysis. So to try to figure out what is the bioactive conformation of the molecule, to just to build up some mimetics or even to find new hits. So now, and, uh, and then later on, just running docking, if you have the, if at that moment you had the, um, you had the crystal structure available. So to be honest, for those working in GPCRs at the very beginning, it, it was nothing there, right? So now with technologies like cryo-EM, with new technologies uh, in, in crystallography, uh, there are a lot of new crystal structures and complexes that can guide your designs. So then these together with a lot of new models in, in permeability, AI, so you have like a, I guess that more chance to be success these days than we used to in the past. Sometimes it was in the past, it was like, okay, it looks like serendipity, right? So, uh, but these days it's like, okay, so there is a lot of kind of big rational design in every, in every molecule, every chemist made these days. Okay. Uh, Ashley, maybe you could follow up. What 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 projects in the past might have been affected by current you know software that you're using today? But how would you maybe approach it differently? Yeah, and 
to reinforce what Sonia was saying about ComChem, I think it, it really does make a big difference. And you don't mm -hmm. need to get into the detail of being able to run the MD and everything like that. Um, you know, if you're uh, a sort of medicinal chemist dealing with the day-to-day, -day, you don't need to be an expert comp chemist. But using it trains your mind to think differently about the molecules and to focus on the fact that they're not those flat lines drawing carbons together. Actually, they've got shape, they've got structure, and it's interactions. So I would say you know, that really is a tool that, that helps not just deliver the answers, but it actually helps to train your mind to think properly about what is a molecule and how what does it do. But I think as well, the, the other thing is, you know, although the basic problem we've had is the same as it was 30 years ago, the amount of information we get now is so much better. Yep. There's so much um, more precise information around how things are binding, about the, the range of other interactions they make, you know, the sort of you can go and get 400 plus kinase you know sort of data points out from you know, knowing you know whereas it was well this is a selective compound and they reported five right. <laughs> so dealing with that is then the challenge and that's where the database tools come in and the visualization that we got in those database tools really helps you to understand how to pull all that data together um, and so I think that has made a huge change too uh, in terms of where we were and where we are now uh, in terms of trying to just deal with that huge amount of data that we've got that we need to uh, focus in on. Interesting. And Dennis, your thoughts, please. Yeah, I, I would agree with both. That's actually what Ashley just said is what I would have said. That data visualization is such a powerful tool that you know we just didn't have. You can visualize things like IV, IVC, like very quickly, right? You can see like how is your lock D trending with your permeability, right? Back then, people looked at like single data points. Now you can like see the trends very easily. You know, you don't even have to go into Excel and the, you know figure out a graph yourself. It's done with two mouse clicks. You have the graph in front of you, right? It's really, really powerful what those tools with the visualization can do and you know back, back to what ashley said you know critical thinking and and data driven decision making that's something that's extremely important and making those decisions uh you know very quickly and um with with uh, with a big amount of information is is really enabled by those tools i also like to say um i've, I've worked with um virtual reality uh, these days mm -hmm. which kind of cool. Uh, Sonia would probably agree to that. So basically what Sonia said, it's such a different thing, right? To look at a 2D computer screen and like right. interact with your mouse, but but then actually touch, like touch a protein, right? Change residues at like a, at a hand click, rotate the molecules with your hands. It's really, really powerful. I mean, it's it's in the beginning, it's kind of in its infancy right now, but I think it can can also make a, a really big difference uh, in medicinal chemistry. So virtual reality, I think, is also a powerful tool uh, that's that's coming coming to us these days. No, that's actually a fascinating one. In fact, I, I only just recently start, uh, was experienced some of that 3D inside a protein. Um, and the fact that I walked around a valine residue thinking I was going to bump into it tells you right there that this is a new, this is something different than, than looking at on the, on the screen. Thank you. So actually, uh, I've seen a lot of uh, sort of agreement in some of the answers here, but I, I was curious, do each of you, and we'll maybe start back with Dennis, um, do each of you think a lot of these things are universal truths across all of the different, because we've got a lot of different sizes of companies from very small, just a couple people just starting up, up to, you know, large organizations with tens of thousands. Do these same principles that you're discussing now apply really across the whole spectrum? Or maybe are do some are more relevant in certain cases? Well, uh, I guess you know I'm I, I'm an early stage scientist, but I did I did work at Novartis, which is somewhat of a bigger company, and now I'm, I, I'm at Fibrogen, which is kind of a mid-sized company. So I did see kind of both worlds. In my personal opinion, I think the skills that we're discussing here are somewhat universal, right? Like 
it should it is some really the same as as Sonia mentioned in the beginning. Even the challenges, uh, you know, maybe decades um, back are similar to the challenges that we face today. Um, that being said, bigger companies and smaller companies are obviously different in terms of the politics that that are run there and and such, right? Whereas in a big company, you may be leading a project, and that may be one project among many. In a small company, you may be running one of two or three programs, and it's very, very important for the company. So that can give you more of a, an impactful feeling. You're making a real big impact to what the company is actually achieving. While in the big company, you, you may be working on a project um, that's externally, you know, like there's a lot of competition from externally, but internally there's not so much attention to your project. And so you have to deal with the, with those kinds of uh, challenges and, and navigate around that. And in a big company, still be motivated, but because ultimately the goal is to bring a drug to the patient, right? Regardless mm -hmm. of where you work in a big or in a small company. I see. Sonia, do you have any opinions on that? I, um, I can only talk about my experience. I've mean, been in the in my career. I've been only in the big pharma, right? Mm -hmm. So, but I can I can feel that. I mean, as Lily actually just embraced other biotech in in this uh, in this recent year. So, and with a different culture. So, at the end, it's the culture of the company who is actually mm -hmm. just doing making a difference. So then, for instance, I mean, for getting things done, so sometimes in big pharma, are like, okay, so it's, it's not as vital, I can say, or flexible, or this is what Danny said, right? The policy is actually just all around you. It's trying to protect you at the same time, but at the same time, it blocks you sometimes to move mm -hmm. quickly, right? So you are actually just focused on what you are doing, but it is true that if you want, for instance, to run a collaboration with the academia, you have to go through a protocol to get this approved. If you want to be here, for instance, today, you need to go for a protocol to get this approved. So then it is a, it is kind of different. I guess that is, at the end, is for protecting the company, right? But, mm -hmm. uh, but it's true that it's sometimes in your, in your daily work, it creates some, some some travel that you need to actually deal with. Ashley, do you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, so I mean, I've worked in big, medium, and currently in terms of small molecules, small. And yeah, the, the basic skills you need are the same, but the resources you have available are very different. So what's called yeah. upon you is very different. So Pfizer, if I wanted a small molecule X-ray, uh, they had a group that did it. <laughs> Right. Now I have to go out and negotiate outside, the contract in place yep. to get it done. Everything takes longer um, and the barriers are higher. So do I need it? Don't I need it? Becomes a bigger question. So okay. there is a big difference between the size of the company and how you can operate. But at the same time, yeah, you get to do so much more in a small company because there's no one else there to do it. It's just you. So yep. yeah, you get a much wider exposure. I mean, when I went to Zoetis, that was actually animal health. And so right. I got involved in effectively clinical trials. I oh, write there were cows, but, you know, they were effectively clinical trials and things like that, which you know, you, you're divorced for, from sort of in terms of the early discovery in a big pharma. You know, it's all compartmentalized and, right. and it's consensus driven. So there's less people to influence in a small company but there's less resource and you need to do more but the basic skills are the same yeah i agree the, the skills are actually the same and it is true what you said right at the end you have all departments and uh, people expert very close to you to get the project done and then i guess that in, in a small companies focus on so they need for instance just to run some uh, i guess kind of a big campaign of compounds to be made in China, right? So while you have here your chemists as well, so you have like opportunities to play in between the two. So yeah, for sure there are a lot of difference, but it's true that I mean, at the end, the scientist has to have the same skills, independently yeah. aware. Yeah, but there are less, you know, in a small outfit, there's less medicinal chemists around. So you've got less other people. So you really have to guard against that uh, sort of, going down a rabbit hole and because there's no one else to help pull you out 
Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I think big, medium, large, everyone's outsourcing now. So everyone's got to have that ability to influence and, and direct outside. But in a small company, it's much it's a much bigger part. You know, there's it's outsourced almost everything as opposed to you know that tranche and this is done internally. Right. Interesting. I actually sort of along the same tact is again when I, when I was in the industry and so forth, I was unfortunately not very successful in bringing things to the market. So I, I'm curious. I, I think a lot of times these projects, a lot of good science is done. It's been excellent, but in the end, they don't necessarily result in a drug um, being produced. So how would you define success for a drug discovery uh, chemist or scientist uh, these days? That if in the end you don't have a drug to market, how do you define success? Yeah, and, and the truth is actually it's the majority of the projects that don't lead to the clinic. <laughs> yep. Uh, and <laughs> you can have a successful career and never get a drug on the market. Uh, I think I've only just got one out through Pfizer that I've worked on ten years ago. Um, a, another one which was a smaller one in Japan, and that's it. But I don't think that I was unsuccessful. Um, I think you know the medicinal chemistry projects I delivered on delivered their objectives. Uh, okay. We had a, a compound that had the right PK, it had the right activity, it had the right selectivity. It was the right tool compound to go and progress and see you know could you actually deliver what you wanted from that. So to me, those were successful projects. You know, okay. the things I could influence, things I actually had a um, a degree of control over I delivered on so it's a success I actually have no control over whether that underlying mechanism is actually going to deliver in the disease state right but I do have control over the quality of the tool compound I've produced out of my medchem project that's an interesting way to look at it interesting Dennis your thoughts yeah I, I think that's that's hitting the nail in the, in the head right there actually um, controlling what you can control, right? That's that's an important thing. And again, what Ashley said is right. Um, most drug hunters face the challenge not going to the clinic in their career more often than not, right? And this is because human biology is extremely complex, right? Uh, well, the, maybe the reasons for why, drug, why drugs didn't go to the clinic or you know failed in the clinic have changed over time, I think. Uh, it's in the 90s. It was more like a PK type of failure, right? Whereas these days, it's more like efficacy and safety, right? So it's really important uh, that you deliver on what you can, like controlling the. Or we have the tools available these days, right? To make compounds that have really good PK, right? We can even predict that from in vitro atme properties these days, right? And and the models are getting better and better. But if your, let's say, efficacy model just really didn't predict what's clinically happening, so if the animal model was completely different to what's happening in the human, that's just something that's really out of your control, right? Well, with the safety, you, you have safety assessments early on, you have in vitro safety assessments, even in vivo, you know, animal studies, but then ultimately, um, you know, there, it's a different organism that you're testing these kind of things on. So in the human, always something else can kind of pop up. And I think if you as a team, you know, moved, as Ashley very nicely said, the right compounds, the right tool compounds forward to answer the question, that is, is, is really a success. Another thing that I'd like to add is maybe even if you made a no-go decision, right, you, you basically did all you could and uh, you, you, you think at this point there's no, nothing more to do, I'm just not getting anywhere. So we call it quit, right? To make a no-go decision, I think is also a success. You have to think about it, especially as Ashley just said, but right? if you're in a small company, uh, there are only a few other projects and there's like few resources available. So you have to uh, you know, bring these resources to the right projects and you have to think about opportunity costs, right? So you know, even making an, an informed no-go decision, data-driven no-go decision can be a successful um, story in my opinion. Interesting, excellent. 
Um, Sonia, your, your thoughts on this also? Yeah, I totally agree. Even a no-go decision sometimes is better than go decision. So I mean, if you're spending a lot of effort, a lot of people working in the project, so as soon as you can actually deliver the no-go decision, it's kind of going to be yeah, even better for everyone, right? That's not for the assets and the assets in the company, but I mean, just, just also for you working in a project that doesn't go to any any place. So for me, I mean, success, it is kind of, um, obviously by definition is that you get your goal. So then if your goal is to, to actually design a new medicine, that would be the best, right? But everyone it is knows these days how challenging it is. So I think Dennis mentioned about the biology and the complexity of the biology in human and it's, I mean, it is, it is very, it's very challenging and as well as the safety. So even though you think that everything is under control, it is not the case many times, right? So I guess that, I mean, for me as a says in a drug hunter, it is just to go uh, rapidly to just to move to a different strategy. This is actually something that is key. For instance, I mean, I guess that these days, at least big farmers are actually not only delivering one candidate for a target, right? Just to try to, right. to be sure that, I mean, uh, we cannot really be failing in the process as well. So at the end, so then it is kind of, called, so just, just to have like, again, a lot of flexibility to actually discover a new scaffold a new molecule that can have different properties that perhaps, perhaps hopefully, can actually be uh, get the final goal. So then, daily, I think that if you are able to open new hypotheses for the team, to deliver a new series of compounds, to find a very different interaction with the protein, perhaps to analyze if your designs are actually doing something differently or even just creating a different property profile for the molecule, it is, I would, I would say that this is a success. Oh, that's quite interesting. Actually, we're getting a lot of questions um, that are coming in on, on a whole variety. <laughs> I, I don't think we'll, we'll get to them all. I was trying to uh, sort of find some common themes and a couple of them that I found are if you were an either an early stage or up and coming scientist, maybe you're still either in college or graduate school and, and approaching this, um, what advice would you give to them, um, uh, especially if they were maybe interested in chemistry uh, primarily? Um, and again, it, it maybe comes back to some of the comments you made where you can't be an expert in everything. So they're very young, they're coming up, they're trying to decide what maybe to focus on. Do you have any advice that you might give somebody on, on that stage? We'll start with Sonia. Um, I would say, um, yes, uh, you maybe, you, you know how you are strong in, right? So mm -hmm. and what are your strengths? So yes, yes, speak up when you arrive in the company about your strengths. And what you feel, you what it is making you to be comfortable to to actually start growing up from there, right? You will see that you are going to have some weakness as well in the process. But I mean, this just just being focused in what it you are are making you different and are making you singular, right? So it is. I think that it also helps you as well to actually start from the scratch and moving forward. So you're good in organic, organic chemistry, so let's, let's build up on there, right? You, are, you want to move to use a kind of new modalities like flow chemistry, so let's start doing this. So then, then I guess that I mean what you need is just to do not be shy at the beginning yeah. when you start a job, just speak up and say and tell what, what are your strengths, what do you want to, how do you envision your career in five years? And I guess that I mean, as I mentioned earlier, so to have as well, everyone has a supervisor, but as well as having someone else that has been in the company for many years that you can actually can help you in mentoring your activities too is, is very beneficial. Interesting. Ashley, any of your thoughts, please? Yeah, I, I'd echo many of those. I, I can remember starting work and my boss saying, well, this is the project and we could do this, 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 this. What's your thought? <laughs> yeah. So finding, finding someone you can work with, the right mentor, is really important because you want someone who's going to help build you up, not sort of suddenly make you feel 
I'm small and I don't know what I'm doing. But you will be. Step forward into your discomfort zone. You know, I mean, and try and do things, but but recognize what you don't know. So reach out to others for help. Yeah. Um, because what you don't want to do is to sort of, oh yeah, I can do that, be overly confident, um, and then you know, sort of get dis discouraged because it doesn't work out right or things go wrong because there was something really obvious that other people with more experience would know, but you don't know. So, you know, work with others, step forward into your discomfort zone and, and take things on um, because that's the way you're going to learn. And really, you know, at the beginning, you are learning. You're, you're, most of us started doing synthetic chemistry sort of right. PhDs, and then yeah. we'll um, the the rest of it. But embrace things. I took on comp chem. I've taken on vaccine design. I've done a whole range of different things which I never learned. I had to learn, and I had to work with others to learn them. So I think that really is, is be open, step forward. And I think there's a lot of what Sonia was saying. And uh, but you know, don't don't just try and do it on your own. Find find the people who know and work with them so you will learn. Do you think things should be being done a little bit differently now to um, train up and coming um, uh, discovery scientists or medicinal chemists or even computational chemists? Are we, uh, you know, are we just doing the same things in graduate school and in college, or should we be adding something new that we think it might be missing? I, I, I think one of the big weaknesses in people coming out of the college is it actually appreciates some of the importance of the soft skills. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I've had people who are, are absolutely brilliant synthetic chemists, better than I am, but they don't know how to interact with the others. They don't know how to accept the uncertainty that's involved in this process, because that's one thing we haven't touched on. I mean, you have to deal with uncertainty as a scientist. You, you'd right. rather deal with certainty. A goes to B goes to C. Sometimes you actually have to make the decisions without having all that data. So. All those soft skills, I think, are, are not emphasized quite enough. Uh, it's okay. more hard skills. And the soft skills can make a big difference to how effective you are in applying all those other things. Right. Interesting. Dennis, your thoughts? Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking uh, if you're not decided yet of what you want to do, um, it, may it be process chemistry or medicinal chemistry coming out of college, right? I would say speak to people who are in the job and who have been in the job a really long time. So just talk to them about how is like what is their day to day job look like? And then, you know, like think about whether you would want to be working in this type of job. And even during college, I would recommend doing internships, right, um, to like see fit um, in, in a particular job. And if you then commit it to something, for example, like us, we're really passionate medicinal chemists, right? Like we love data. We love to see what our compounds are doing. Like in college, like sometimes you make compounds and then they're thrown away or like you publish a paper. But here in industry, actually people are yearning for your compounds, right? They, they want to see like, oh, are they active on, oh, are they metabolically stable? Are they soluble? So people, people here are kind of waiting for your compound. So it's, it's like a different thing. And I would say, once you start it, start asking questions, start wonder about things. If you're a naturally curious person, which typically scientists are, like really think about, you know, like what is going on. And, and although you may not be having all the knowledge and you will never be able to have all the knowledge in the world, nobody does ha have that, um, start, uh, you know, somewhere start on your project. I mean, basically, you know, every single project in drug discovery is like, you know, like it's, I, I'd like to think of it as a small company that wants to bring a drug to the market, right? And you're part of that company and you want to bring that drug to the market. So think about, are you working on the right scaffold? Or may there be another scaffold that, you know, you with your synthetic skills that you got in grad school can open up to the team that the team hasn't thought about. Right, like really take a deep dive into the data, which is where the scientists are really strong, and then really ask questions. Start with asking questions, and you know, take it from there. Uh, let me follow up. Another question just came in was uh, their question specifically was how industry has evolved to increase the chances of success to deliver a drug. 
I, I'm maybe I can rephrase that a little bit. I mean, in your opinion, what is the one of the more significant uh, changes that industry or biotech has taken recently to improve their um, chances of success? And and also, what might be some of the shortfalls or gaps that biotech and industry still have, a uh, pharma still have in drug discovery? Yeah, that's that's a really good question. I think a lot of money is spent to to answer those types of questions, and there may not be a really kind of definitive answer. But I mean, what I've been what I've been seeing, and that goes back to the point that you know Ashley brought up earlier, uh, is the training, right? I see like a lot of investment in the soft skills. So HR is really stepping up and trying to train very early on these really uh, fundamental soft skills that people need in order to be successful drug discoverers. In order to uh, address those technical failures that, you know, like we have, like that we talked about a little earlier with like, you know, failures in the clinic. Um, I mean, people are, uh, companies and people are really trying to use the most effective software that's out there um, to like drive decisions and may that be even no-go decisions. Mm -hmm. And I, th I think that's that's something that industry has been doing. But I'd love to hear other perspectives too on that. Actually, can we maybe have Sonia? Yeah, I can. I can. I can mention this. So uh, um, a little bit of that. So I got bi biologics is one of them, right? It's a new modality that is actually making a strong impact in the market. So uh, there are others like uh, peptide, uh, and uh, I mean, facing with peptides is always challenging. So, and it is something we we already have some uh, some targets that are also peptide uh, targets. So then, how to work with PPI interactions? So it's kind of challenging in the industry as well. So new modalities like products are coming are coming to and have been and actually I think that are gonna be actually very strong in the future. So then this new technology actually allow us to embrace other different modalities in the in science. So that we are learning and actually it's good because I think that I mean uh, we having people from the academia so that is it's always great because they are coming with a completely different mentality. So I really, really enjoy working with uh, with new scientists because they are actually having they are coming with a, a lot of energy. So that is uh, is always that is always needed. So they are actually very open to learn. They are open to actually grow up in their careers. So learning very fast, and they are amazingly much better than I used to be when uh, when uh, with these new technologies so to be honest so i think that they are actually just growing in this environment they are build, they are actually just coming with a lot of new skills at the same time i agree completely with ashley and dennis about the soft skills so there are something that is very challenging sometimes for from coming from the academia but again it's the same so don't 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 be shy so whatever you need so even your supervisor or someone who is actually just close to you so yes they can provide you with this information and you could be able to actually just uh, just kind of jump this obstacle as soon as possible right so you actually do not speak up uh, sooner but it's gonna happen, it's gonna create a lot of conflict in, in, in yourself, right? So then uh, then uh, this actually just blocking you at the way of uh, just seeing others kind of developing themselves and, uh, and it's something that shouldn't be happening, right? So I guess that it is completely, I really recommend everyone to actually just uh, speak uh, up as, as soon as possible in, in your early career to actually get an, an, and I really like what you said, Denise, about just see you are fitting here or there. It was, it was actually my case. So I joined Lily as medicinal chemist and six years later, I become a computational chemist. So then I, you feel that, I mean, I like medicinal chemistry. I like working in small molecules, medicinal chemistry, but I, I really thought that I'm better just uh, building up non-real compounds than building the lab. Right. So then, uh, when you realize about this, so uh, then virtual campus is good for me, and I, I have organic chemistry background, so that is good as well for companies because you are building and designing 
kind of molecules that can be made in the lab. So then if, but you have, I think, we, you have a lot of opportunities to move in the different scenarios, right, in the company. So even though you are coming from pure organic chemistry, you like other modalities, so you have the chance to move. Mm -hmm. any, any thoughts on this uh, from you, Ashley? Yeah, um, I was thinking about it. I mean, really, it is the depth that we go into things now, which is very different to where it was in the past. Mm -hmm. the, you know, the range of ancillary assays, the understanding we got about what it takes and the data we get, it really has transformed the way we, we can work. Um, but so saying, I mean, if you look forward, still our biggest weakness is under, understanding some of the bio, basic uh, biology, particularly okay. neuroscience, yeah. is probably one of the biggest areas where there's still need. And one of the key things that stops us making progress there as medicinal chemists is actually the understanding about what goes on in the brain <laughs> and other than a very top level. So, but I think, yeah, it embrace things. It comes down to some of the qualities we talked about earlier on, you know, that flexibility, the breadth of understanding, you know, looking at what's coming on, whether it's protac and embracing it, looking at it, understanding it and being able to apply it and then, the more you know at that depth, the more you can sort of see opportunities, I can apply that here. So, you know, actually it's valuable again, the conferences and just listening to talks which are um, not what you're doing, but are adjacent to it because it can make you think a bit more broadly and make you spot things that you can transfer from one area to another in order to have a big impact. So, and, and, and increasing that depth is really has transformed the industry. Right. This has been fascinating listening to your uh, thoughts and opinions on uh, on some of these topics. Uh, we're actually running a little, we're, we're not quite out of time yet, so I'll, I'll maybe try and get a few more questions in. Um, one I was curious about is how did the pandemic and some of the changes and some of the challenges we went through uh, in the past few years changed drug discovery and the way that you work? Uh, today and do you see these things persisting? Um, maybe Ashley, since we were on you, if you could maybe your thoughts on that. Yeah, I can't say. I mean, I'm working from my basement. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a change which pre-pandemic wouldn't have been there and wouldn't have been available. So that, at that level, it has some change. But in terms of what's needed for the drugs, I don't think it has necessarily had a huge impact but it's just made it more flexible but um but i think the, if you look at the bigger area i mean there's we are at the whim of those changes which happen in the regulatory environment and in terms of perceptions of people in the bigger environment and we have to be cognizant of those so you know um the the requirement to not just have a drug that works but it's got to be superior you know um and the requirements for sort of safety, the the, the sort of green um, environment, which is impacts on you know sort of the manufacturing side of things. Once we actually got the drug, we've got to be cognizant of all those things, and they do impact us. Um, it may be slightly more uh, sort of tangential, but the, you know, bearing them in mind is is important. Mm -hmm. Interesting, um, Dennis. Yeah, uh, I actually worked in infectious diseases before COVID was a thing, and we had a COVID program in twenty uh, in two thousand nine. Actually, that was oh, shut wow. down. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, as you know, like uh, large big pharma has exited uh, infectious diseases uh, before COVID started. Uh, so, you know, largely very minimal programs in, in viral or bacterial diseases or tropical diseases. Uh, but, you know, this has changed now. So now there is way more uh, interest in way more. I see biotechs popping up in infectious diseases, um, mainly viral diseases. It's, there is just a, a little bit more funding available for like pandemic preparedness, right? Because this could happen with another virus, right? Mm -hmm. So people need to be prepared for that. And, and I think the industry as a large has recognized that and they're way more programs now on, on pandemic preparedness. And I definitely support that. But 
the way it has changed working together, I think is also really fundamental in that we're now hybrid, right? Some pe some of us go to work, some of us are um, in their basement. <laughs> some, some of us go to work like for three days or two days or something like that. And the communication, I think, is a little bit more challenging. One of the things I mentioned earlier as an important skill, right? So like, you, now you need to be able not only to communicate with your colleagues face to face, which I still think is the best way to go, but you also need to bring in people from virtual. Now you may have hired people that don't live where your company is and you, you need to be able to communicate with them. And if you're a project leader and you need to convince them of something or influence them in some way, I think it requires a new new type of skill. It's, it's, it's not that influencing itself has changed, but the way you influence mm -hmm. is, is different uh, virtually, right? Or like through a screen. It's, it's difficult because you're not looking that person really in the eye, right? So it's, it's in my opinion, a very, very different thing. Um, so the challenges remain the same, I think, but we have to use different methods sometimes to uh, be most effective. Okay. And yeah. some... Chase very quickly. I think that we sure. have only one minute. So, okay. but it's, it's kind of, yeah, it's exactly what they said. So the only difference that I notice is that the hybrid situation that you can actually work from home or just be physically in your office. Yes, very, uh, I mean, just surrounded by chemists. For the rest, it's true that, I mean, uh, if you work in a big pharma that is very uh, global pharma, we are used to work in a virtual environment, obviously. So for mm -hmm. in this regard, we didn't it didn't make a lot of impact, right? Because we were prepared, we have everything already um, already uh, pre done because we do, we are working in kind of a global teams. So that as, that's at least in my, in in our situation. Okay. Well, again, you're right. We are out of time. Um, I, I it just it. It went by very quickly. I enjoyed every every minute of this. Your insights were were uh, quite fascinating. And once again, I'd like to thank uh, all of you for for joining today. Um, we will try and get to uh, some of the questions um, uh, and maybe uh, and we will also be providing this as a recording. But once again, thank you all for participating today. Thank Thanks you very much, Chase. Bye.